There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. I was in court on a contentious case and the last issue was a Cuisinart mixer. And at the time, you know, the collective rate between the two attorneys involved was well more than what a new one would have cost. But it was that both clients were so emotionally entrenched. And no matter, you know, there there was just in that moment, that was the last issue. We flipped a coin. My client lost. And she then offered another, call it $500, more than what, you know, we had already decided this crazy mixer was worth. And she was going to write a check then and there. And the answer was no. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money Podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Triggering or empowering? You know the stat, 40 to 50% of marriages end in divorce. And money is the taboo and charged topic that usually plays a very leading role in divorce. In this episode, I share a bit more about my own divorce, but I will tell you it was both emotionally and financially draining. That's an understatement. I thought I knew what to expect, but wow, (laughs) there were so many hidden costs that I felt completely unprepared for. Here's one that might surprise you. You know, something is seemingly as tame as airline miles can become a huge bone of contention in a divorce. Who gets the miles? How much are they worth? How do you divide them up? Thankfully, you don't need to know all the ins and outs, because in this episode, Jamie Berger and Sarah Jacobs, both founders of Jacobs Berger, a boutique divorce and family law firm, pull the cover back and share how to take divorce from distress to de-stressed. You'll learn all about the hidden costs of divorce, how to prepare yourself, how to deal with the emotional side of divorce, and so much more. I get it. Divorce is not a fun topic to talk about, but I would much rather you be prepared than not. So let's get talking about it. 
So we're going to talk about divorce. Um, I have been through a divorce myself, so I'm going to sprinkle a lot of my own experience in here to hopefully get some, you know, expert advice from both of you. But I got divorced about, um, gosh, it's about 12 years now, and it was really hard. You know, I'm not going to not going to sugarcoat it for for anyone. And there's a lot I think that you don't think about. For me, I had no idea also the emotional impact of divorce and like how long it would take me to feel like a sense of normalcy or to, you know, deal with with some of the issues. And, you know, money wasn't in my case the cause of my divorce, but it became kind of the key issue, like the real, you know, wedge for for both of us. And it led me to having to like rebuild my life financially in my early 30s with debt and kind of start over from this place. And, you know, there was a lot of shame for me because I'm a money expert. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I went through this divorce and I basically had to give up every single asset that I owned in order to just kind of walk away. Like, who am I to give money advice? And then I realized like, oh, I think I'm actually probably the best person to give money advice because I've kind of been to this place. And you know, I think that when everyone gets married, we don't think, okay, I'm going to get divorced. That's hopefully not what we're thinking when we say I do. And yet it happens and it's really, really expensive. And I think, you know, it's just really hard to prepare for it all. Like one of the things I had to leave behind, like all of my family pictures, they were on my ex-husband's computer. And so like for, you know, 10, 12 years of my life, I basically have no pictures of myself, which is really crazy. But I mean, I'm sure you guys are going to share a lot of, of, of stories with us. But it's hard to prepare for. There are so many different hidden costs that we need to think about. So just kind of start us off here. What are some of those hidden costs that you know you don't think about when you're considering divorce? So I, you know, and I think what you said about divorce being emotionally stressful is probably the first hidden cost that actually, and I know it's not money based, but it's the first hidden cost that people don't really understand. They understand that the big D word is coming and that there's going to be emotional, but they don't understand the life cycle that goes with it. And as you said, it took you a very long time to get from one place in your emotional stage to the, the end places to a place where you are now. And I think people don't anticipate that. But when we're talking about the actual hidden costs of divorce, everybody thinks legal fees as the number one. Some people think expert fees, you know, forensic accountants, uh, custody experts. But a lot of people don't really think about budgeting expenses. And we can talk about that on a micro level. But, you know, we all have our binging problems uh, with our television. It's all of our guilty pleasures. And a lot of us are. What are you, what are you talking about, Sarah? <laughs> uh, um, Nothing. Obviously, it's not a real thing. I mean, I'm making it up as we right. go along. But um, for those of us who, you know, like to decompress with Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, you have your streaming issues. And everybody's used to having one account, going through the home, having different profiles. Well, okay, now add that as a second expense if you're separating and you're not the one maintaining the original account that you were paying for. Add that to your line item. Think about your car insurance. Think about your homeowner's insurance. You had an umbrella policy and now all of a sudden you don't anymore because you have two different households. You might not qualify for the umbrella policy. Costs go up. Think about um, airline miles. If one of your spouses traveled for business and they acquired a ton of airline miles and that's how you paid for some of your vacations or points on your credit card and now you're splitting those assets and one party is retaining them and the other party's not. You're paying for something that you haven't been paying for for years because you've been using a reward system. So there are all of these little minute issues that you go through in your day to day life and you're using them to help supplement your cost of living. And boom, here you go. You're replicating these expenses on a whole other level that you haven't been putting into your lifestyle budget when you were thinking about how much alimony you might need or you will pay, how much child support And you're not thinking about those small pieces that, yes, each individual, one of them, they're $20 here, $30 there. But over a year, over multiple years, when you add it all up, you could be talking about tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, the airline miles and points thing, I'm glad you brought that up because that was something that was a... um, you know, bone of contention in my divorce. And I was like, wow, I mean, even as a money expert, like I didn't think about 
that, but that's so true. And then you have to figure out, you know, how you split those up. And there's just so many like nuanced things. It becomes really interesting. Well, and I also think, you know, I think for, for us with our clients specifically, like that budgeting process is really difficult, especially when you have somebody who wasn't maybe responsible for that in the relationship and they weren't handling the finances. So they just don't, they don't know what they're spending money on day to day. And so, you know, it comes down to, you know, going through credit card statements, going through bank statements and really replicating that. And there's a lot of times this like aha moment, like, oh my God, I'm spending this money in these categories and I didn't even know about it. And to Sarah's point, you know, if then you want to say take the same vacations that you were taking, but you don't have those airline miles or rewards or, you know, hotel points, like it it is another cost that you really have to consider. You know, can you can you have that same standard or can you have a reasonably comparable standard of living? Or do you have to diminish your standard of living in some way? And so that's those are the you know the hard conversations that we have daily. I also think that the other, another point that a lot of people don't think about, and, and it goes back to the issue of sort of like experts, but people think about the experts associated with their divorce process. They don't think about the experts that they're going to need later. Like now they're having all this money that maybe their spouse managed previously, that their prior accountant managed or their prior financial planner managed. And now they have to go out and they have to find one. They don't understand the difference between fee-based or asset management. And there's a whole other learning curve with trying to figure out what their future life is going to look like. And some people, you know, do you need a professional organizer? Do you need a whole new wardrobe? Because you're coming, going back to work and you haven't really thought about that and you have to purchase it. So there's a budgeting issue with regard to the small items in your lifestyle, but there's also that future forward facing like, okay, I might not have had those expenses in my prior iteration, but I need them in my future iteration because my life has changed and now I'm doing something different. Absolutely. So obviously the emotional piece, that's very hard to prepare for. Like you don't, you don't know it till you're in it. I, you know, one of my best friends at the time, she told me she'd been through divorce and she said, you know, the only way through it is through it. (laughs) And the only way you're going to understand is to go through the process. But, you know, some of the other things, some of the other hidden costs that you both were talking about, there can be an element of, of preparation there as much as humanly possible. But how do you how do you prepare for all this? How do you set yourself up for success or like figure out what you know all of this is? Because to me, it's like we're basically kind of deconstructing right our lives and like trying to figure out all the puzzle puzzle pieces. And you know, I know specifically for a lot of my female friends who were getting divorced, and this doesn't just have to be a female issue, but I, I find some sort of trends is a lot of times they don't know where the where the money is going like on a daily basis and so it becomes really hard to figure out you know what are all the costs and and where all the money is going so how do you do this so i think you know certainly from the emotional piece and i think sarah and i both feel very strongly that it's important to take it's probably the most important thing you can do in a divorce process is to take care of yourself take care of your emotional well-being because you can't be you can't you know be the the parent you want to be and be dealing with the stress of the divorce if you're not really focused inward on like what you need to do. And for everybody, it's different, right? You know, so, um, you know, for some people and, you know, Sarah and I are both big proponents of, you know, therapy and, and, you know, having that type of resource, you know, whether it's for the family, whether it's individual, whether it's both, um, you know, but really having that set up early in the process or before you start, you know, can really help work your way, you know, through some of those emotions. Um, you know, I tell clients all the time, if you're, you know, if you're paying me to be your therapist, you're, you're overpaying for a service I'm certainly not qualified for. So let me give you some resources <laughs> so that you have, you know, you have the right people in your corner because you need it. You need to take care of yourself. Um, you know, and then there's, you know, there's, there's support groups, there's, you know, there's leaning on, you know, people who have been through the process and understand, you know, um, you know, maybe the financial insecurity that you were talking about of not knowing the finances and, you know, kind of just having a network of people to talk to, um, you know, with the understanding that they're not your legal counsel, but they can give you, you know, advice as, as a friend and, you know, a trusted confidant to say, you know, this, this will get better. There is, you know, we always say like, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, the only way through is through and you've got to get there. But, you know, we've seen firsthand people coming through and really, you know, having 
wonderful life experiences after the divorce. And that's, you know, that's what we focus on too, when we talk to clients, like, you know, don't, don't get bogged down in where you are right now. It, you know, try to be forward facing and think about the next, the next phase of your life, because it really, it helps a lot. In piggybacking off of the concept of like the emotional evolution during the divorce process, but also trying to figure out how you can get information that you don't have. Control is key, right? Control is key in this is this is a process where you have little control um, in terms of the overall big picture, what the court will do or how things will turn out. But you can have micro levels of control. You can control the divorce attorney that you pick and that you partner with. You can control the people in your support system. You can control your reaction to things, even if you can't control what's being said to you or what's happening around you, you can control how you respond to it. And I think finances, as you said, is really difficult because you were talking about the idea where you don't know you're, you're the, you're the individual that doesn't know where the financials are, how to get the information. And, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do that as a money expert. I'm sure you are familiar with the idea of hiring a forensic accountant, dumping a a bunch of information or documents on their desk and letting them, you know, let their fingers do the yellow page walking through your financials and putting a picture together for you. But, you know, some spouses may not have access to it. Everything's electronic. It's going to one spouse's email. It's hard for them to get copies of statements, never mind, figure out what that actually means. And one of the, the most secure ways for a party to start looking through their financial picture when they don't have anything is getting a copy of their tax return. They can. They can do it from the government. They can get a tax transcript. They can go to their accountant if their accountant has prepared one and they're entitled to that copy. And that is a minefield of information. It lists certain, you know, institution names. So at least you can start somewhere with some level of knowledge. It shows you some level of earnings. It shows if there's real estate, et cetera, et cetera. And we try to break it down for our clients and make it very digestible and understandable Can it because it can feel exceedingly overwhelming. And if you can find an institution name, you have, you know, legal techniques like subpoenas and the like. If you can, you know, see there are discovery tools, as you know, during the course of the process, not things can't stay hidden forever. If there was a paper trail for them, you can find it at some point. Um, You know, if you know who your provider is and you live in the house and you know that your your electric provider is GCP&L. You can call them. Hi, this is so-and-so living at this. I'm not sure if my account is current. Can you give me that information? Sometimes they'll tell you you need the special PIN or the account number and, and you run up against a roadblock, but sometimes you're able to discover information that you didn't necessarily know that you could that's yours to discover. So we try to walk people back from the cliff of, oh my God, there's nothing here that I know about and I'm totally overwhelmed to, okay, today... On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, at you know one o'clock in the afternoon, what can you take control of, and how can you access it? And the the immediate moment that they start getting information that they didn't have before, the calmer they become, and the more ways they actually think about and tell us, "Ooh, I know that this thing is here. Can I call that?" Yes, yes, you can. That's your information. Great. And they make themselves a list. And miraculously, some of the information shows itself. And I, I just want to add to it's empowering. Like what Sarah was saying, like you see, right. you see Absolutely. the change in the clients that you're working with, especially those who had that financial insecurity at the beginning. And they, they sort of emerge as a, a butterfly at the end. And they're like, oh, like I, I've got this. Like I can... I can take this. I can run with it. I don't. I don't need you to handle that. I'll, I'll get the information for you. And it really is like for us as practitioners, it's 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 why we do what we do because we get to see sort of the other side of it. Um, and the other thing that I will add, and what I always tell people to do, is you can run. You can run. Um, a we can get you know income statements from Social Security, so you see you know the, the historical right. earnings, but also um, run a credit check on yourself. Yeah. Make sure, you know, there haven't been Ooh, right, credit cards yeah. that are open that you're not aware of. Make sure that, you know, there's not debt that you're not aware of. I mean, you know, listen, your your credit might take a little hit from from running a, a report, but it's worthwhile because you'll get that, you know, that wealth of information and a little bit of financial security going forward. What happens if you if you run that credit report and you find something like you find 
credit cards or whatever it might be open that you didn't either authorize or remember or like, are there ways to go about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, you tell your attorney, you know, and you, you, you trust in the person that you're working with and that you've partnered with to, to advocate for you and take care of you. Um, but you know, if there's, if there's a debt load that one party was unaware of and, and really unaware of, you know, not, Oh, I, I know I opened this credit card and I, um, you know, then we have to sort of drill down on, you know, what, what's on that credit card? You know, was it, was it routine marital expenses or was this really something nefarious where you didn't know about it? And there were, you know, you have a a spouse who was living a double life and, you know, and taking care of maybe, you know, somebody else or doing something that, you know, really is not part of the marital enterprise. And so, you know, in those instances, we can, we can either negotiate or we can litigate that issue and say to a judge, you know, this is not a debt that should be considered marital because my client really didn't know about it. And, you know, we've had cases where signatures have been forged, you know, to open credit cards. It's, I mean, we live in a world where unfortunately all of our information is accessible and it's on our phones. And so, you know, it's pretty easy for, you know, if a hacker can do it, your spouse can do it. They know all of your personal information. So uh, you really have to be, you know, careful that, you know, that hasn't been going on. So that's one of the first things that we recommend to clients in cases. We had owned a um, like a vacation rental property, and um, in the divorce settlement, he, my ex husband got got that property, but I was still um, on the the title of mm-hmm. that and on the loan, and it was in the divorce decree that he was supposed to keep paying the payments or whatever. And you both probably know what happens. Like a year later, stop making those payments. And all of a sudden I was getting notifications that my credit score was, you know, in the, in the crapper. And, <laughs> and it was just the moment of like, I mean, you, you thought the, the thing was all done. You thought that was like in your past and then something else just kind of comes up and hits you in the face. And, uh, you know, I would imagine that that happens in a, in a lot of, a lot of divorces that, you know, even when you think that the divorce is over and it's like finally behind you, then something else kind of comes out of the blue. I think that happens fairly frequently to most people in the divorce process, especially if the divorce was high conflict or there was a lot of acrimony or there were a lot of um, surprises during the initial phase. There tends to be a, a, you know, like an earthquake happen and then you have the aftershocks that come after that. It, It sort of continues. One of the things that Jamie and I have gotten really, um, I want to say adept at, but sort of like committed to is the idea, and and this sort of dovetails into what we were talking about before, of introducing our clients to the issue of forward-facing control and um, saying to them, okay, during the divorce process, let's get a new accountant involved, or let's get a new financial planner involved, or let's let's get a life coach involved, or let's get X, Y, or Z so that not only can we help talk about what you're doing in this moment, we can help set you up for what you need to do when it's quote over to your point. And then you already have that team of professionals, or that team of resources in place so that when the aftershock or the surprise pops up, you're not scrambling to figure out how to deal with it. In that moment, you already have a sort of safety net underneath you to and a resource table to go to and say, OK, this is going on what should I do in this scenario and how do I immediately fix it? Because in that moment, you're living another life and you're trying to walk away from everything that you sort of wanted to leave behind and it's sort of chasing you and you need to find a way to give yourself an out in that moment. And if you're set up with that sort of solid foundation underneath you, it's easier to pivot, handle it and keep going like a speed bump rather than like a massive detour. Yeah, the only, you know, and the other thing that I'll add to that is that, you know, there's things that you can do during the process to protect yourself too. And there are things that your attorney can do during the process to protect you from some of those aftershocks that, that Sarah was mentioning, you know, work into your agreement specific language, you know, in the event that, you know, in your case, the, the rental vacation property isn't paid, there's recourse available to you that's already in your agreement. So even, even if you have to go back to court to enforce yes. it, you've got specific language in there and specific guidelines that have to be filed 
you know, followed. So you're not starting from, from scratch. And I think that that's, you know, incredibly important. Um, And a lot of times, and I think Sarah and I see this a lot when we get involved in cases like what you're talking about, it's considered post-judgment after the judgment of divorce, these enforcement issues or modification issues is we're playing Monday morning quarterback where we're looking Mm -hmm. at an agreement where we weren't necessarily the attorney who was responsible for negotiating the agreement at the outset. And we see holes and flaws where they could have been avoided. And if, you know, you know, and I had a, I had one particular very egregious case where I knew I wasn't the attorney who, who resolved the case, but the attorney at the time should have known that the wife in that instance was going to be really difficult about selling a piece of property. And, you know, the, the agreement said something to the effect, the property is going to be sold. Well, great. Who's going to sell it? How are, you know, how are we going to pay for repairs that they need to be repaired? What happens if she doesn't cooperate? Does he get power of attorney? I mean, there were, and you saw these issues coming a mile away and you didn't protect your client from them. Like, so, so I think for us, sometimes those post judgment things are frustrating because we're like, you know, you could have seen this coming, you know, we could have built some language yeah, it was in the details. Right. And so, you know, there are things that you should do as an attorney and, you know, a client should work with their attorney to try to make sure that you're, 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 you're trying to avoid as many aftershocks as you can. And it's impossible to avoid them all, but, you know, do your part. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. 
Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. So, you know, obviously divorce, it's like, you know, two people who've decided they don't want to be together any longer and they're, you know, dickering out how things are going to, you know, how they're going to split things up. There's obviously different state laws that that dictate different things. but you know, it could go on for a very long time. You know, people can be very headstrong, very whatever word you want to fill in the blank with. Um, and they just don't want don't want to budge. So how do you or what do you say to your clients or anyone listening who is maybe going through the divorce process? Like, how do you know that moment when you're like, okay, I I should give this up or or I need to just um I just need to settle this point so we can get this divorce over with. Like, how do you guide people through that That's process? That's probably the hardest thing that we do because, um, you know, it's it's difficult and it's emotional. And, you know, people assign different emotions and weight to different things. And so, you know, when you really are at this point where neither party is budging, um, you know, it, it's the cost benefit analysis. What's the cost to you emotionally? What's the cost to you financially? Not just the cost for me as your attorney to sit here negotiating this, but you know, what's, what's maybe some of those other costs that you're going to, you know, have to have to take on if you agree to this, um, you know, in this particular way versus if you don't agree to it. And it's sort of going through that cost benefit analysis with the client in a really meaningful way, um, you know, and saying, you know, is this, is this worth it to you to continue to fight for? And if it is, we will do that. And if it's not, then what can we compromise on to make you feel like you've got the benefit of, of the bargain, so to speak. So it's, you know, again, it's, it's hard and it's different for everybody. It's different for every case. I think one of the things that we have learned over the years with our experience and also sort of trained ourselves to do, train our staff to do with our clients, and we try to train our clients to do, is that in the beginning stages of this, we sort of try to establish their goals. What are your goals? Not what do you want? Not do you want to keep the house? Not this, not that. What are your goals for the future? If all of this was over, said and done, we could wave, wave a magic wand. You could, you know, leapfrog over where you are now to the end. What do you want? the outcome to be in terms of what you want your life to look like. And then we try to work backwards to say, okay, how do we establish a legal path that is, you know, cost effective, reasonably attainable, that will lead you to your goals. And every time one of these difficult conversations come up, we try to go back to that original conversation. You said your goal was, you know, being able to afford the house until the kids were out of school. Okay, what are you fighting over? Where And then folding in the cost-benefit analysis that Jamie's talking about. How does this lend itself towards that goal? Have your goals changed? If your goals have changed, we need to know that because we've been walking a path towards one set of goals and maybe your set of goals are different. I think the other thing is learning to read your clients. Are they fighting for the sake of fighting because that's all they've known and that's what they've been entrenched in and they feel that they might lose and then having the difficult conversation with them about what does loss actually mean? Like, is this a real loss to you or is this just letting someone else win and you can't let that happen? Like, where is this motivation coming from to be deadlocked over the 17 year old armoire that somebody's parents bought them on the day that they're married that they really neither of them want but they won't let go because the other person said that they might actually want it and trying to unpack the emotional drivers behind that and reframe it and refocus it for them to fixate again on that set of goals or their new established goals and walk them towards that instead of the actual item or, or concept that they're fighting over. Yeah, I think that's, I think I, I, mm. I will tell the story because you asked for a story. I mean, I was in court 
on a contentious case. And the last issue was a Cuisinart mixer. And, <laughs> and at the time, you know, the collective rate between the two attorneys involved was well more than what a new one would have cost. But it was that both clients were so emotionally entrenched. And no matter, you know, there, there was just in that moment, that was the last issue. We flipped a coin, my client lost, and she then offered another, call it $500, more than what, you know, we had already decided this crazy mixer was worth. And she was going to write a check then and there. And the answer was no, because it was a conversation piece. So it was like that to me was like this real example of, you know, it, there, it was the fight to fight and that, you know, it was like the let, you know, everybody was hanging on to that last win. And, you know, it, it, those are, those are just emotionally driven conversations that we, we deal with and you have to know how to navigate and when to, and when to say, you know what, okay, this is, if this is your, if this is the hill you're going to die on, this is the hill you're going to die on. It's so fascinating. Like it's such a, interesting like inside look on mm-hmm. like human nature and uh, like how we operate i bet it must you you must have some like really great um off time you know with a cocktail <laughs> kind of <laughs> sessions of like oh my gosh i can't believe you know x y and z yeah. the cuisinart right. right it must be really interesting well i another thing i wanted to ask you about um you know, I, I'm remarried now, uh, almost you know, ten years in, and we obviously went through the pandemic together. And we would just constantly say, because we both had been divorced previously, like if we weren't in a solid relationship, I would imagine that this pandemic <laughs> would cause a lot of relationship issues. Have you seen kind of an uptrend since the pandemic of of people, you know, getting divorced or having those conversations about divorce? Yeah, I think, you know, we certainly saw it early, you know, when, when I, I think we saw two things. We saw when like sort of the world reemerged a little bit, um, you know, people were, were just focused on, um, you know, getting that trip in that they didn't take for two years or, you know, or sort of like having that sense of normalcy. So I think, you know, there was, we all saw the memes on, you know, the various social media outlets, you know, that it was going to be this like divorce boom. And I think we saw it maybe like six months later, like we saw it, there was like this trend, you know, everybody kind of like came out of a cocoon, experienced life, and then was like, oh, wait, I remember I really don't want to be married to this person anymore. So yeah, that vacation wasn't so great. Um, uh, But yeah, you know, we listen, you're, you're, that was, it was crazy for everybody. You know, you have kids, you have homeschooling, you have jobs, you're, you know, and so the, the, the mounting pressure of everything, I think for a lot of people was just too much. Um, And, you know, you stick, people who are already on the fence in a house together for two years and tell them they can't leave. It's like a, it's a perfect uh, recipe for disaster, frankly. Um, So yeah, I think we definitely saw it, but I, I, you know, we were surprised by the the gap in time afterwards. I actually think and we've had this conversation. There's been two trends, you know, because obviously divorce is our bread and butter, but we do a lot of family law. So we've seen We've seen the boomerang on the other side of it, too. We've seen a lot of prenuptial agreements start coming through with the people who were in relationships who maybe have, you know, getting married later in life, who have careers and who have assets and who are established, having lived together during this period or dated during this period. And now they run or, you know, they want to commit to each other because life is fragile and and you need more time and you don't know what's going to happen, but wary about, well, maybe I didn't know about that spending habit, or maybe I didn't know about the way that you, you know, like your DoorDash or et cetera. And now they're more inclined to take the step of prenuptial agreements and put that together than they were previously. But I think we're also seeing that second wave of divorce for maybe some Mm, of those individuals who weren't thinking about it beforehand and who didn't have an acrimonious relationship and who weren't on the precipice, but who didn't really know their spouse anymore because their quote busy life before the pandemic was so busy that they were able to sort of like orbit and circle around each other. And they only saw each other and on vacation or on certain things or at family holidays and didn't really have that day to day conversation 
or their kids were now home from college instead of leaving because they didn't have that empty nest syndrome. And now the empty nesters are actually empty nesters, or they had that period of time where they actually had to talk to each other. And they were like, okay, I might not dislike you, but I'm not sure that you're who I married anymore. And I, I don't, I don't want to spend another I don't have 50 years to say. doing yeah. this. I, I want to go out and do my thing. And you're seeing that change or like, I'm, I'm now in my, you know, heading towards our, our retirement age. And you're like, "Mm -mm, nope, nope. This is not the type of life I'm going to live. And this person didn't want to reemerge the way I wanted to reemerge committed to this. And they're happy to stay stuck in their ways. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I love you still. Bye. I'm out. And I think it's, it's a different shift in that divorce, but it's a different type that we're seeing. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Want to know the number one money question I'm asked? It's how to get started investing without being overwhelmed. So if you're asking yourself the same question, then you have to check out the Investing for Beginners podcast. The host, Dave and Andrew, they break down investment terms and strategies in a way you can finally understand. I love that they're making investing accessible and they have an entire podcast dedicated to helping you invest better. Even if you're not ready to start investing, they explain the stock market and financial updates so you can really understand what is being said on the news. If you're ready to learn more about investing, I'd recommend you start with two of my favorite episodes. Listener Q&A, how do you start investing with a thousand bucks, where they explain how you get started right away. And back to basics of building your portfolio, where they explain how to build a portfolio from scratch. The Investing for Beginners podcast is a great way to start expanding your relationship with money. Find Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Yeah, that's really fascinating. That I mean, that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I could see how all of those different scenarios would present it themselves. So I, I want to also talk about like the moment that you have that conversation with your spouse that you want to divorce, because I remember mine, it was gut wrenching. I remember what I was wearing. I remember the day, you know, everything. And I think a lot of people who, you know, there may be somebody listening who wants to get divorced, but there's just so much fear of having that conversation and talking to that person. And you're, you're never sure kind of what the reaction, I guess, is going to be on the other side. Do you have any tips about, you know, how do you gently walk into that conversation? Like what you should say, maybe what you shouldn't say? Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about this, as I'm sure you can imagine and talk to clients about this a lot. You know, one of the things that I, um, I will recommend to clients is, is do it on neutral ground, you know, like do it somewhere that, you know, maybe not in your house, maybe, you know, not in, in a place that there's going to be sort of that like emotional component. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, know your spouse, you know, you're married to them, whether you're married for a short term or, you know, or a long period of time, you know them, you know, are they, are they, you know, are they a morning person? Are they a night person? You know, don't, don't bombard somebody when you know it's a particular time of day that they're, you know, if I, I haven't had my cup of coffee and someone's going to come talk to me seriously. <laughs> not, not the right moment. Um, 
you know, the, the logical stuff, make sure obviously you're doing it, you know, in, in a respectful way, um, as much as is humanly possible, you know, it, it doesn't help to have the, you know, the laundry list of reasons why you want a divorce in front of you and go back 17 years to the one time that they wronged you 17 years ago that you haven't been able to get over. Um, you know, that's, there's, there's, a lot of, you know, a lot of sort of like logic and common sense that I think can help in the process of of having that difficult conversation um, in a way that is respectful. And it can really set clients up for the next phase of communication that's going to be necessary in the divorce. So um, as much as you can handle, you know, you may not you may not be able to stand looking at that person, but you married them and, you know, just try to remember the reasons why when you approach that conversation. I, I think the other the other piece to that too is know your you know Jamie's talking about the time of day and the location, but I think also like the season that you're in right now. Um, and when I say season, I don't necessarily mean fall winter. I mean like season of life. If you're if you're walking into you know a wedding or college graduations, or you're just about to head on that family vacation that you've been planning for like six months it might not be the best time to be like, oh, by the way, I want a divorce and now we're going to get on the plane together with our three kids and we're going to sit there and I'm going to be in your company in a hotel room for the next 10 days. Or, hi, we're going to your family's wedding and now I'm going to, you're going to have to stand there in front of everybody when they say how great your spouse looks and you're going to be like, yeah, just kidding. I just told that person that I don't want to be with them for the rest of their life. Like, there's no good time. Sounds fun. Sounds fun. It always is. There's no good time (laughs) to talk about this. That is, that is the precondition. There's no perfect time. You can't wait until the stars align, but there are better options than not. And I think, you know, when Jamie said, don't come with your laundry list of things that they've done to wrong you, including that time 17 years ago, I also don't think, don't show up with the laundry list of ways you've worked out how you're going to split the assets or what things are going to cost either, because you may have given this a year thought, two years thought, six months thought, three months thought. They may be blown away in that moment and be unable to even hear you, never mind comprehend what you're saying. Or they've had three years worth of of thoughts about it too. And they're like, oh, hallelujah, thank you. We're on the same page. Let's sit down, but be offended by your idea of what fairness means. And then that has set the next, as Jamie said, the next phase of communication up poorly rather than constructively. So know your audience to her point and, and, and know your bandwidth too. Like if you're a key person who likes to come and blurt everything out because you've unloaded it off your chest and then, you know, mic drop and walk away, maybe take a step back from that because that may not be received very well. If you're, if you have difficulty talking and getting it out and you're beating around the bush and your spouse is kind of sitting there scratching their head, like, where is this conversation going? Get to the point, like make it clear to that sort of take stock and, and figure it out first. Don't don't do it in the moment if you can avoid it. All right, let's let's flip the script a little bit and let's talk about healthy relationships. So I, I mentioned I've been remarried for almost 10 years now and I really wanted to do things differently. I wanted to set myself up and I know there's probably someone listening, either they're coming out of divorce or they're trying to figure out like how to do this quote unquote right in a healthy relationship. You know, what are the financial documents that you want to have in order to, you know, from from the get go in a healthy relationship to really figure out where you are from a from a financial standpoint as a couple? So I think, um, you know, I think communication is key in that situation, yes. making sure that you are communicating about all issues. But, you know, we're we're focusing specifically on the on the financials, making sure that there is an understanding of you know what what you are coming into the relationship with versus what your spouse may be coming into the relationship and how those intersect with one another you know what assets you have really having that sort of that financial literacy conversation as part of the the process is really important um and then just, you know, open transparency about finances, you know, access to statements, access to income information, you know, the more the more you know, the better equipped you will be in that relation to have a healthy financial relationship with your spouse and that, you know, that is that if you didn't have it before and it's something that's important to you, then you really want to walk into the relationship with that. I I 
I almost take a step back from the the question that you asked in terms of like what kind of documents are important. It's almost irrelevant what kind of documents are important if you haven't had the conversation. And, you know, Jamie said communication, but I think more about there's another level of conversation that I see happening there, not just what what do I have or what debts do I owe and what am I coming in with and who, you know, do I owe my ex-spouse anything and do I have obligations that, you know, transcend you, but also how do you want to live your financial life? What do you consider conservative spending? What do you consider excessive spending? What are what are you willing to spend on and what are you not willing to spend on? And and you know, how do you view the issue of finances? Are we a unit? Are we independent? Is this a 50-50 contribution? Is it percentage of income based? Like just the whole idea of how do you live your life financially and how do you compromise when there's a dispute? Um, you know, I'm still happily married. And when I came into this relationship with my husband, he he wanted a prenup. And, you know, I'm a divorce lawyer. And I said to him, honey, we don't need a prenup, but go ahead and talk to, you know, 10 of the people who may not be friends, my friends in this community, because they'll give you the truth and tell you how the, the, the world works here, because we had very different mindsets on money. We had, you know, I, I lived with debt. debt. Debt made sense. I went to law school. I had student loans. You know, I had I, had a, I financed my car and he was debt free. I mean, there was not a dime that, except for the mortgage that he was willing to have for the house. And if we hadn't had this conversation in the in the guise of a prenup, which you always don't have to have it under, we may not have had a conversation up front about what spending looked like and what saving looked like. And you know, the differences in, in, in sort of the upbringings that we had come through and how we wanted to merge that moving forward. You know, we're together now, we're married 18 years, we're together 23. The conversation that we're having now is very different than the conversation that we had then, but we continue to have the conversation. And I think a lot of spouses, either in their first marriage or in a remarriage, and congratulations, by the way, on remarriage and it being a decade long, um, we, we don't talk about our habits, our money habits. We may talk about money, but we don't talk about it in the way that we interact with money. And I think that is the most crucial conversation because it doesn't matter how much you have or how much you owe. If you're not in alignment with how you're going to handle it with your spouse moving forward, that's when it falls apart. I think that's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's so much great information. And I, I think we're just sort of we're we're right we're just like hitting the the tip of the iceberg here in in the conversation and divorce is this just dizzying process i think even if you're in a quote unquote good divorce there's still like so much flying at you and it's hard it's hard to know what to do and specifically when we're talking about money that happens to be this taboo topic just already very charged topic so you know to just kind of close this out here for for anyone listening if if divorce is on your mind, you're thinking about it, you've listened to this conversation, what do you want someone to remember about, about the process, about how to navigate feelings, how to just kind of move forward from here? I, I think for me, it's um, not to ignore yourself, not to focus on all of the other stuff that's going on because there's going to be a lot, you know, not to focus on all of the other stuff um, and exclude yourself from that because if you don't take care of yourself in the process, it, it is only exponentially harder. Um, and then you find yourself in my professional opinion, you find yourself at the end, you know, questioning like, who am I? What, you know, what are my needs? What do I need? So really addressing that during the process can, can be helpful to finding that, you know, light at the end of the tunnel that, you know, that we've seen. I think for me, it's being introspective, which I think is an offshoot of what Jamie's talking about, but introspective about what mistakes did I make? What mistakes do I not want to make? Because it's easy in divorce to play the blame game. Somebody else is responsible for all of the unhappiness in the world, but it takes two to tango on most levels. Obviously, you have your extremes and you need to understand your own contribution and you need to understand what your goals are and what your desires are and how you're going to take control of partnering with your support team to reach those goals in a healthy and productive way. I think if you're not honest with yourself, if you're not really thinking about what you want and how to achieve it, 
you're going to end up in a situation where you may get, quote, everything you wanted and it's none of what you actually needed or can sustain. And now you're, you know, somewhat unhappy with the result, even though it's, quote, a win because you didn't you didn't really think about it. You need to learn how to get out of your own way so that you can be a different, better version of yourself moving forward and shed the stuff that didn't work. Divorce is a crazy, like the craziest, <laughs> biggest, scariest roller coaster, even in quote unquote good divorces. But I, I wish I would have had an episode like this one to learn from before I went through my divorce. I'm guessing it might have saved me a lot of money and probably a lot of heartache. So if you want to connect and learn more, you can connect with Sarah and Jamie. Visit their website at www.jacobsburger.com. Their website has a ton of great information. You can also grab their ultimate guide to divorce before the process so you can feel just as comfortable as possible with your decision. If you got some value out of this episode and you know a friend or a family member who's going through divorce or thinking about divorce, send this episode to them so that they can find their way through this, this crazy thing called divorce. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guests, as well as the sponsors who make this show possible. I will see you back here, my friend, in a few days for a brand new episode.